A lot of people don't know, like L.A. Reid, the way he picked Usher's singles, he would bring all the interns in there and play a song and say, okay, what's Usher's next single? This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. There will still be the journey. The journey. New Sheriff in town, and the name is the journey. Journey. This thing is bigger than Nino Brown. This is the journey. The journey. What is it that moved you? The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. Welcome back to another episode of The Journey. I'm your host, Larry Robinson, and today we have a Memphis icon that I know you're going to love. But first, we're going to get to our quote of the day. And it comes from the first African-American female astronaut. And it goes a little something like this. Never be limited by other people's limited imagination. First of all, you are you have infinite possibilities and never let anybody tell you what you can be, because if they're putting their thoughts on you, it's already limited because they don't know from which you come. So listen, today's Memphis icon comes from Tresman High School. He's a product of North Memphis. Entrepreneur, father. Used to be dab a little bit in audio video production. <laughs> Husband. We're talking about none other than brother Tory Dabney. How you doing, sir? It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, man. I'm so honored that you're here. Thank you for having me. So, so listen, tell us a little <laughs> bit about Early Tory, like, Early. like like when you you they brought you home in in the basket in the manger. <laughs> Early North Memphis, yeah. um, it was you know the typical kid life. Okay, you know what I mean. You oblivious to really what's going on around you. You just you know you're just in the midst of everything. Who was it? Who was at home with you? Uh, both my parents. Okay, uh, but I spent a lot of time at my grandmother's house in Smoky City. Okay, so okay. Um, and just. A lot of cousins. Okay. A lot of, you know, um, my mom, she was the oldest of 10. Oh. So she had me pretty young. Okay. Uh, she was still in high school when she had me. So when, and I think the youngest brother was eight when I was born. Okay. So when I came, came around, um, it was like, they were my brothers and sisters because I didn't. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. the only child. Aunts and yeah, your aunts and uncles like yeah. brothers and sisters. Exactly. Oh, wow. It was a two bedroom house with thirteen of us. In there. Okay. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. There's a lot of love. In lot, that lot, house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you had to eat your food fast. <laughs> <laughs> or at least get to the kitchen yeah, fast. Exactly. Oh man. So um, you said your mom was there, but uh, father. <clears throat> grandmother, so, grandparent. Well, so it was uh, my mom. Like I said, she had me when she was in high school, uh -huh. and my biological father okay. um, didn't claim. Oh, yeah. So I didn't meet him until I was twenty-eight. Um, but the uh, the gentleman who raised me, right, which his name is Michael Dabney. Okay. Um, he raised me and I just seen him as my father. Right. And it's ironic how I found out that he wasn't my dad. Um, what happened? <laughs> so uh, we were at a funeral and I had to be about three or four. And um, I didn't, I don't know who funeral it was, but uh, my aunt and my mom were upset with each other. So it was a funeral that was in Mississippi because that's was my, where my mom was from, Tunica. Okay. And while at the funeral, I was sitting in my dad's lap, the one I knew was my dad. Right. And my aunt leaned over to me and said, that's your real dad right there. So oh, that's jacked up. <laughs> so your mom went off. <laughs> your mom went crazy. So she didn't she didn't hear us say that. OK. So when we got home, I was like, uh, Mom, how can someone have two dads? And she's like, what do you mean? I said, um. Uh, Dean told me that that guy at the funeral was my dad. My mom said, hold on one second. <laughs> oh, my beard. Yeah. <laughs> so she went to the back and she said a few choice words. Uh -huh. And then she came back and she explained it to me. And when she explained it to me, I was like, oh, okay. So I've always been amazed at how some brothers have been able to take someone mm -hmm. that is not their biological. Correct. Correct. But man, you can't tell. I got a good friend, and I shot him out, Fabian Matthews, mm -hmm. who 
who's done that. Mm-hmm. And, and and I just I think it's the most honorable thing yeah. you can do as a man. Yeah. I think that instilled a lot in me too because like now I'm very given to other people's kids, mm-hmm. you know, outside of my own kids. But um and even at a young age or throughout my life, I never came to him like you're not my dad. Mm-hmm. Never. I never okay. said it to him anything like that. I knew there was a little resentment. As I grew up, I can understand a lot of the things that <clears throat> was taken out on me. It was probably just due to the fact that I'm really not his child. Okay. Um, but um, What do you I mean? Know. Hey, unpack, unpack that, brother. <laughs> like, we, can't, we can't let that one slide. Um, you know, like discipline. I was disciplined for very small things at times. Like that, that really... I guess in my eye, it wasn't that serious for me to get the discipline that I got for whatever That's I severe. did. The punishment yeah. didn't meet the crime. Correct. Okay. Correct. But I respected him at the same time. Do how if you guys ever reconciled that as as well? As he's men? passed now. Okay. okay. Um, and um, he ended up getting um, addicted to drugs. Okay. So I was young then so it was a case of the house became very rocky okay um and my mom was trying to hide it from me a lot then but um it was it was obvious because they were starting to fight a lot right and we'll leave them you know constantly we'll move out and we'll move back in and that was my constant my life wow and being that he was addicted I had friends who were the servers. Wow. And oh, wait, we gonna, we ain't gonna, we, <laughs> hey, we gonna unpack that one because we got some other stuff that we gotta I got to unpack you. as well. <laughs> but when did you know you was gonna be okay? When, did, when could you look in the mirror and say, I can handle this thing called life? I don't, I don't really know if I just looked in the mirror and said that I can handle it. I, I think it was more so to say, you gotta get over this. You gotta go. Okay. You just gotta keep going. So, uh, life was a constant. Let's gotta we gotta get we gotta go. Even when we were moving out, we gotta move before he get off. You know, we gotta go. We gotta go. And it wasn't it wasn't a case of me just getting over it. It was a case of me saying, okay, this is just one situation. We just gotta keep going. Who? What? Did, who did you dream you would be as a kid, man? I mean, I didn't. You know, did, did you have like those? I didn't really dreams. Or? I didn't. I didn't like. I'm not a sports fan now. Okay. Um, I I really don't have anyone that I say, oh my god, I wanted to. I didn't. I didn't see that. Okay. You know, uh, my uncles. I looked up to them. Oh, so that was outside of the household, or they were inside the house? They were outside. This is you okay, know me, so, my mom, and my dad. So. so they were outside. So those were the people that you looked up. Shout out your uncles now. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to my uncles. Well, Lee, most definitely. Okay. He was the one who taught me everything. He taught me how to fix on cars, pretty much everything that I, that I know now. Wow. Um. Uh, so he, uh, my other uncles, you know, each one of them, you get something special from them. Right. And you know, I. I What did you get from Lee? Lee just. He just taught me to hustle. The hustle. Real. Yeah. He taught okay. me to hustle. Like, uh, just like I said, he taught me how to fix on cars and things of that nature. And don't don't sit there and cry over spoiled milk. Okay. That that type of deal. He kept it real with me. Gotcha. Gotcha. You know? Well listen, man, you know, this is the end of the segment and we got I always asked this one question that that, that individuals kind of put them back a little bit, but Every black man typically has that moment mm-hmm. when they realize they are a black man yeah. or a black boy. Yeah. What was that for you? <clears throat> Hold on for a second. Mm-hmm. Listen, we'll be right back on the journey <laughs> where Brother Dabney going to share with us when he realized he was a brother. <laughs> Stay right there. The journey. Larry Robinson on the Kazookian Network. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. Success in life is not a straight line. There are twists and turns in everyone's life, and the more you know about their story, the more you'll understand the process. Kazookian Media Group proudly presents The Journey, a show that features successful black men in Memphis telling their stories of their lives, 
and the ups and downs they've encountered on their ultimate road to success. We believe the journey will encourage young men and help them see that life is a journey. Watch The Journey, hosted by me, Larry Robinson. Brought to you by the Kazuki Media Group in partnership with the Delta Boule. Welcome back to The Journey. As you know, we have brother Tori Dabney here, who's our Memphis icon. And before he left, he, we asked him a very poignant question about his blackness. But before we go there, I want to know, what's your superpower? Superpower. What's your superpower? <sighs> if they're lining up all the X-Men and the last X-Men is, is Tori Dabney. Out thinking. Really? Yeah, out thinking my opponent. So you look, you, you little mastermind over there. Try to be, you know, okay. Like, okay. I try to think ahead of what you're. I try to be one step ahead of what the next person's thinking. Do you think that came from your childhood of exactly. always having most to definitely. move? Most definitely. So it, it was a, one ahead, one step ahead. Most definitely. It, it was a case of don't get comfortable. Hmm. Um, I have a friend, um, like even now with my company, she's like. You know, things are going good. You know, I said, it's coming. You know, I don't know if that's a good thing. I'm always thinking right. that I know it's coming. And I don't I don't get caught up in the hype of the good times. Right. And I think that's just from the childhood of always being ready for something to happen or something bad to come okay. and trying to figure out how to get out of it. Wow. Wow. So before we broke, um, we asked about your blackness. Mm -hmm. When you when was that moment <laughs> that you could say, "Okay, I'm different," or "Okay, this yeah. is they holding this against me"? It, it's it's ironic uh, going right back to when my mother and I we would leave. Okay. Right. So we had moved into this apartment complex, and I was at the swimming pool, and I had to be probably seven or eight years old. Right. And I'm just sitting in the pool and a family comes in, a white family comes in and the little kid, their son, he had to be about four per okay. se. So he comes over, he's sitting on the step with a splash and his feet in the water. He said, mommy, look, a nigger. Oh, wow. So, and she was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. But I'm, I'm eight, you know. I don't know how to come back on that. Right. You know? She said, mom, look, a nigger. She said, oh my God, I'm so sorry. But now I'm being older. You taught him that. It's not you something, right. you know, it's not something he just got by himself. Right. And, um, but me being young, I was like, it's okay. But it, not knowing it was, it's not okay. Right. But that was one of the times that I can remember of just really being wow, like, singled out. Traumatic. <laughs> childhood brother <laughs> but now i think we've all had some of that, that kind of experience um what's your fondest memories of your childhood man? fondest memories yeah um what's that thought that you know it, when you think I about it it bring your bring my, your smile to your face my go-kart my uncle lee helped me put together that was really you couldn't tell me nothing because he taught me how to drive when i was 10. so uh, you you couldn't tell me i wasn't a nascar driver driving <laughs> <laughs> Lee is your superhero, yeah. man. Lee, Lee is the man. Shout out to Lee. <laughs> yeah. Go kart. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is there anything uh, in life that you would say? No, let's, before we go there, mm -hmm. what about your school years, man? I mean, what do you remember about like middle school? <clears throat> any, middle any, school? Anything? School was cool for me. Really? I wasn't, I wasn't very studious. Okay. You no, know? um, I wasn't, but I was. I was liked upon a lot of people just because of my charismatic mm -hmm. attitude and okay. very witty or whatever. Okay. So I got along with pretty much everyone. Okay. okay. Um, so my, my, my high school years were pretty good. Um, originally I started in New Jersey. I went to school with my cousin for a year, uh, my seventh Wait grade year. Wait a minute, bro. Stop. Uh, <laughs> time out. Time out. We ain't gonna go from North Memphis to then New what, Jersey it's, without it's, telling me how in the world you got to New Jersey. You can't just be yeah, throwing this stuff out, brother. So my, my cousin 
which we're nine months apart. Okay. Uh, his mom was in the military. Okay. So when she originally went into the military, he stayed with our grandmother. And he would go to school with me. for. And he was very good at school. He was a straight-A student. Uh, so he would help me with my homework a lot. So being that he went to school with me for a year, I said, okay, I want to go to school with him for a year. So his mom went to Bayonne, New Jersey on the base. So I said, I want to go to school with him for a year. My mom was like, and thinking about it now, and it's, it's, it's crazy. My mom was very, okay, that's good. But that was the years of my dad, you know, really deep in drugs at that time. She was, so she so was it was, it was good. Yeah, it was, it was, cause like I said, just thinking about it now, she was very adamant about, yeah, yeah, you should go, you should go. Mm. Uh, but then I got there and my aunt's crazy. I said, <laughs> I said, I gotta come back home. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to school <clears throat> in Jersey for a couple months. I said I gotta come back. Okay. It okay. was cold there. I didn't right. like the cold. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So right. then that's when I went to Tresden. Okay. Okay. And when I first got to Tresden, being that I was in Jersey for wide accent, so I had issues with that. Right. Me having an accent. And right. people were like, Okay, we from North Memphis, we don't know nothing about no accent. We're from North North. No, you don't you don't come here with no accent. <laughs> 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 so tell, so you go off to school, you yeah. go off to college. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what, what, tell us that experience. What what was going on at that time? Um, before I went to uh, American Intercontinental, I went to Grambling. Oh, uh, okay. straight out of, straight out of high school. Okay, I was very bored there, so I left. Mm -hmm. You were bored at Gremlin? Yes, at Gremlin, like there yeah, was. Bro, how you gonna be bored at an HBCU? <laughs> it's. Okay, let let me rephrase it. There was okay, nothing yeah. that was around it that you know that oh, they yeah, offered. You, yeah, you all off in the sticks. you you right there in the middle. Yeah, of the, you know. So uh, came back to Memphis, went to University of Memphis, and said, "No, I can't. I can't stay here. I got to go." And that's when mm -hmm. I moved to Atlanta. I went okay. to um, American Intercontinental. Okay, so in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the experience in Atlanta. Uh, I mean, because so, Atlanta, I mean, because I can't imagine why? someone leaving Atlanta and all that was going on during the time that exactly. you were there. Exactly. Because, I mean, you're talking freak Nick era. Exactly. Right. So, 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 yeah, how you leave Atlanta and come back to Memphis? Well, first, when I, what, what made me go to Atlanta, um, I went for fashion design. Okay. okay. But then I got there, I found I couldn't sew. So I said... <laughs> So I said it's not gonna work, you know. So and then I seen a flyer. Wait, how'd you go to for fashion? Cause I was at University of Memphis. Somebody said, "Oh my God, you dress nice all the time. You should go to fashion school." Oh, I was like, "You're right. I should." Okay. So I left University of Memphis and moved to Atlanta. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So and 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 so you got to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. All to Atlanta. everything's popping off. Man, and Atlanta's so, the center of the universe. Yes. Especially yes. the black universe. Yes. Yes. I, I had never seen nothing like that before in my life. Okay. So, you know, coming from North Memphis, then going to Grambling, where there was nothing around, to going to Atlanta and being like, this is it. Right. This is me. And then being amongst people who are just actively doing something. What were you, so what were you doing? Um, I ended up getting an internship with LaFace Records. Out of, after leaving fashion school. Uh-huh. I, I you, found wait a minute, you get a chance to be an intern at the hottest black label yes. in the country yes. at the time. I walked Maybe in the, the world. Yes, I walked through the door. The first person I see is Tony Braxton standing there. Oh, Lord. I'm in awe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in awe. And uh, I said, I'm here for the internship. They said, you hired. I got hired on the spot. Okay. So uh, a lot of people don't know, like L.A. Reid, the way he picked Usher's singles, he would bring all the interns in there and play a song and say, okay, what's Usher's next single? And we would tell him, okay, that's the next single. All right, cool. Y'all get out. And that was the single. Smart man. Yeah. So, Smart man. You know, from TLC, um, <clears throat> when I left LaFace Records, I went to Dallas Austin studio. So I was in a lot of recording sessions. I was with Destiny's Child when they recorded Bills, Bills, Bills. I was there with TLC recorded No Scrubs. Uh, I was in the studio with Whitney Houston doing her last album with Babyface. I was sitting there in awe, like, how did I get here? Right, right. <laughs> okay, but how did you not stay there? Because I was just or, in the room. So as an intern, 
you never saw yourself as a part of that industry, I presume. I, it's not that I didn't see myself a part of the industry. I didn't really tone into my craft. Like, okay. I had someone told me early in life, okay, this is what you need to do. Because growing up, you only seen the artists. You didn't know that there was a whole scene behind the artists, right. the, the record, engineer, things right. of that nature. Right. So had someone directed me and said, okay, you can be a music producer, you can be a record sound engineer. Mm -hmm. Um, then things may have turned out a little bit different for me. Any regrets? I do regret that because I, I have a I have a passion for music. Really, I really do. You, Excuse do, me. Why don't you go back? I'm too old for that now. Oh well, yeah, now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, plus you're making a lot of money now, so uh, you know. Yeah, I'm doing. I'm doing well. Everybody, everybody can't. You know, everybody. I'm doing well. We on your. How, okay, so how many careers would you say? Okay, we start out as an intern at LaFace. Mm -hmm. From LaFace to now, mm -hmm. how many things have you tried <laughs> along the way? So I'm, I'm assuming you're about 23, 24 at Correct. LaFace. Correct. Okay, so. Take us to Tori Dabney now, career-wise. And the reason I'm doing that, mm -hmm. just so I can talk to the audience real quick, is because sometimes we think we've figured out what we want to do Correct. or where we're going to end up. And I've always been interested in the fact that sometimes, like me, I, grad, I was a chemistry major. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't pick up a beaker or anything today to save my life. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's what I mean. It's yeah. like... I get How'd it. you get here? I get it. So, and it, it's, it's, it's amazing that you ask that because, like, you begin to look back at different facets of your life and you get an understanding of why, why you are the way you are now. Okay. Uh, you learn from those different things because, like, like you said, true enough, I was, you know, around major recording artists, loved the life, you know. Um, but like I said, I was just in the room. I wasn't a part of them. I remember one time a guy coming to me saying, man, you, you, you in there because he's seen me with all the artists. Like they were coercing with me and talking and stuff of that nature. And then I, I was thinking to myself, I'm not in there. That's their money. That's their life. I'm just in the midst of it. So Tori Dabney now looks back at those internships. That's what gave me my humbleness. Right seeing those who had wealth beyond wealth made me want that right and then knowing how to handle it once it did in fact come my way mm -hmm. so you look at the different aspects of your life um you may not have gone down the path that you thought you were going to go but what did you learn from it while you was in it at that particular time right so me as a you know as an intern at these different locations what what did i learn because like even when I was an intern, uh, one thing that stood out about me being an intern with the other interns, like they would send us out on a food run. Let's just right. say that as an right. example. Uh, <clears throat> the interns just bring the food back. Okay, your food's here. When I went to go do a food run, I would get that food. I would set it up on the table like they were at dinner. So once they come out of the session, their food is already set up. Right. So that made me stand out from everybody else. Right. And that would make me get requested when you know different artists was coming in. But yet still, I didn't look at myself being an intern for the rest of my life. I'm not here to really serve people. That's just my, that's just me. You know, I'm going right. to go over and beyond anyway. Right. So that's what I took into now. You know, I go over and beyond when it comes to anything that deals with me and managing myself, you know, being a manager for myself and right. looking at what I learned from those different situations. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Where did Dabney Johnson come from? Dabney and Johnson. So naturally, I'm, I'm Tori Dabney, and right. Johnson is Solomon Johnson. Um, he's the one who actually taught me how to read blueprints. Okay. Uh, long life friend over over thirty so years. So first, please tell everybody what you do. You know, oh, okay. We didn't we didn't, we didn't get into that. <laughs> I uh, I'm a commercial uh general contractor okay um i recently built or did the, all the framework for a hotel hotel tupelo in mississippi mm -hmm. uh, i did all the framework and uh, basically built the building at um waste management the, okay. the new waste management building mm -hmm. and um 
there's a new apartment complex that's over off a of Broad Avenue across the street from Broadway Pizza. Okay. I did all the drywall over there as well. And I just okay. got a call that they're gonna be doing a phase two and I probably have that contract as well. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So once again, careers. Mm-hmm. So we intern, then what did you do? When you left LaFace, you went to Dallas, Austin, yeah. then what? Then I came back to Memphis. Okay. Um, then I became a police officer. Okay. Yeah. Police officer. Then what? Uh, then construction. Then construction. Okay. Yeah. Now, somebody told me that there was a health scare at some point in mm-hmm. your career. Mm-hmm. And I, I, if you're comfortable about talking about okay. it, I'd, I'd love for you to share. And the reason I want it is because not only have you had these different careers, you had another wrench thrown into the mix. Correct. And 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 please share with us. If you um, will. I had an aneurysm. Wow. Yeah. Um, 2008. I'm. Um, well, let, let's go back a little bit further. I moved back to Memphis around 2003. 2003. How old were you? I was 28. Okay. 28. 28. Yeah. 28 or 20. Yeah. 28. Um, my mom ended up getting sick. Okay. Um, she had an aneurysm that ruptured. Oh, wow. Uh, so, and sadly, she went to a minor med uh, and they diagnosed her with an ear infection. Had she gone to an emergency room, get a scan, they would have found the uh, the aneurysm and probably could have, you know, clamped it to stop. Right. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> she had an aneurysm that ruptured. So she, uh, she survived it, but just the complications of it. Um, seven years later, she had passed from it. Mm. Uh, but before she passed, they found an aneurysm on me. I uh, right. ended up getting sick, going to the hospital. They did a scan. They said uh, you had meningitis, and, and that's just how God works. Right. Meningitis is only in babies. Right. right. I never the, heard of grown person. Exactly. They say you have meningitis, and we found an aneurysm. And with your family history. Um, we, um, you, you know, we, we need to correct it. Right. And you know, the brain isn't meant to be touched. That's mm-hmm. why it's encased into a skull or whatever. So, um, what he gave me was like, you know, you have 30 years, 30 days or 30 minutes, but your aneurysm is going to rupture. Um, you may not come back as the same person and you may die on the table. What do you want to do? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so I uh, I said, let's do it. Let's do it. So, so you facing your mortality. Correct. At 28? 28. Oh. Yeah. How do you rebound from that? Uh, it goes back to the childhood. So let, we got to go. Let's go. Don't sit here and wait on it. Got it. Let, let's, 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 you know. Um, and ultimately, it's in his hands, you know. If I don't come back from it, that's what it was written. Okay. Um, and in a little side note on that, um, when I did, you know, coming back, so I, it was about a year I was off and I had to learn to walk again. Um, a, a lady that um, I knew, she was like, hey, I got somebody I want you to talk to. I heard you had, you know, brain surgery. So <clears throat> spoke to the lady. She said, look, Mary, he had brain surgery. He's fine. So her daughter-in-law was about to have brain surgery uh, the, in that, that weekend. So anyway, uh, I said, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. And she said, okay. So I went to sit down and say my grace over my food. And the spirit just came over me. It was like, that's all you can say is you fine? Like you did this yourself? I told you I would bring those to you that need to hear this. Because Ooh. everybody, you know, immediately they, they tell you, you have a testimony. You need to Ooh. tell them on the top of the mountains. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't put it on me like that. So... Uh, as I was sitting there about to say my grace over my food, uh, he was like, it like literally the spirit came over me and was like, that's all you can say is you fine. Like you did this by yourself. You take one bite of food, I'll kill you right here. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I went back out there. I said, hey, can you tell Miss Mary to come back? <clears throat> I said, Miss Mary, I said, look, uh, yeah, I did. You know, everything did turn out well for me on my surgery, but um, you just gotta, you just gotta have faith in, you know, um, and and just know that whatever happens is in His will. And you got to be fine with that. And luckily, she, her daughter-in-law, came out fine with it. And then the next time I seen her, 
She said, I, I just got to let you know it was only your words that can get me through it. Nobody else can tell me anything that I need to hear. So he'll bring to me who needed to hear my story. Yeah. Wow. All right. We're going to go back. I'm going to go back to South, uh, North Memphis. North Memphis. North <clears throat> Memphis. You sitting there Saturday morning mm -hmm. eating a bowl of cereal. Yes. Cartoons. Door opens. Mm -hmm. Big Dabney is looking at little Dabney. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what do you say to little Tory? You gonna be okay? You gonna be okay? Yeah. Okay. Like what? What? What you around right now? Don't get consumed in these. This is this is just a stepping stone. You gonna be good? Okay. Use what you're seeing right now is just ammunition for what what's going to happen later. Cool. I'm going to ask you to leave all the people listening to this mm -hmm. with a dabneyism. <laughs> and I want you to look right in that camera and <clears throat> talk to them that they know that they was here for this moment at this time. Go. Um, so I have a motto for myself. It's called a 12 miles in a 24. And what that means is that life is a marathon. And when you first start in a marathon, you have all the energy in the world. You take off, you got all the speed, you got all the adrenaline going, everything's going. But when you hit the 12 mile mark in the middle, that's when your body and your mind starts to play tricks on you. It starts to tell you to do different things. It tells you, look, let's just go back. I'm tired. I can't go anymore. Let's just go back. And then it can tell you, <clears throat> look, let's just sit here. Let's just stay here for a minute because we're really not getting too far. Or your mind can tell you, look, let's just keep going. Even if we just keep walking, let's just keep moving forward. So you have different points with each one of them. If you go back to the beginning, you've done 24 miles. So you really just started all the way up. Those are those who plan on going to school forever and never really go. Uh, it's been four years and you're still saying, I'm going to go to school, but you still haven't went. And then those who become complacent, those are the ones that get stuck in that rat wheel. That's when you're just sitting there on the park bench and you're really not moving forward. You're just sitting there and just staying there. But those who do keep moving forward, you don't have to win the race, just stay in it. And you don't have to win by a stopwatch. It can be a calendar. Just keep going. And for me, it's not even making the 24 mile marker because there's so much more that you can get past that 24 mile marker. So the way that I look at it, I haven't really made it until I stand before my father. And he said, job well done. That's when I made it. Wow. Never be limited yeah. by other people's limited imagination. There you go. So we 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 mile what? What th what mile are we at right now for you? Dad? I'm not even keeping up no more. I'm just running. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Listen, I'm like Forrest Gump. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for yes, spending this time. Yes, sir. I appreciate and sharing you. your journey. Yes, sir. On the journey. Yes, sir. Listen, we're gonna keep bringing them back to you time and time again. There's so many amazing men, black men in this community. And it's my duty, it's Kazukian's duty to keep bringing them to you. So you know, you can be so much more. You can be anything your mind desires. Listen, to the next time, I'm Larry Robinson. For our Memphis icon, Mr. Tory Dabney. Take care, peace. Thank you to our partner, the Grand Boulet of Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity, Delta Chapter. To hear more incredible stories like this, be sure to download the Kazookian app from the App Store or Google Play, or check out the Journey Memphis podcast on all your major podcast providers. Also, check us out on the Kazookian Network. <laughs>